this church different because each and every member of the church is empowered equally to take the podium. It is different from the Pentecostal churches where it is one man's show. If a pastor has been posted to us, then it becomes all in all. It's the one who does everything. But this church empowers members so that anybody can be picked the way today our sister fed us well. And anybody else could be also picked next Sabbath to stand here and feed the church. But also, wherever we stay, the way the someone was, that we be practical Christians. That is why uh, the book of Acts of the Apostles uh, is Christianity in practice. When people are eating, when people are uh, uh, carrying themselves out in the community, how should we carry out ourselves? So this afternoon, we shall have a brief session of um, uh, what is the time. And that is very important for any living being to know. And after know, having known that, then we can shape ourselves and we can then live cognizant of the time. It is only in church where people seem not to be cognizant of um, uh, 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 time. But if you go outside there, you will realize the importance of time. Now, bringing it back to our walk and our journey to heaven, time is very important. At least, even if it is not important to you, Listen how important it is to the demons and to the devil. Because when Jesus was confronted by the demoniac, the one who was harboring 2,000 demons in one person, that is Mark chapter 5, if you begin from verse 1 onwards, and they, the, 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 the demons asked Jesus, why have you come to torment us before our time? So when the devil was hurled down to the planet Earth, he was brought down plus the third of the angels who defied God's rule, and they were given time and at that time, they guard with a lot of jealousy. Within that time, they must accomplish certain activities within that time. And so, us who are also in the battlefield, we seem not to be cognizant of that time. But in that world, they know the importance of working within time. Today, we want to look at something very, very common, and you know, um, it is called the New World Order. And our key text in the book of um, Revelation chapter 21, many a times we read Revelation 21 when we are consoling the bereaved, but it has more than that in it the new world order. And I'll give my brother here a mic. Oh, he has one already. So we'll be reading uh, very fast. So chapter 21 from verses 1 up to verses uh, 5. What does it say? The book is Revelation 21, 1 to 5. Yes. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Verses 2, mm -hmm. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Mm -hmm. Verses 3, mm -hmm. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Mm -hmm. And God himself shall be with them 
and be their God. Mm -hmm. Verses 4, mm -hmm. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor cry, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Verses 5, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Thank you very much. So, John the Revelator is being shown the new world. And he's looking at it and he's seeing Jerusalem coming down from heaven, having been adorned as a bride, as a bride. And those people who are meant to enter that new Jerusalem, they are people who have become new by the standards of heaven. And so no one will be allowed to enter in that new Jerusalem who have got um, uh, the old characters of humanity, the old here referring to sinful nature. Because how will you walk in the gold, uh, golden streets, golden streets, and you have issues with money, you are a, you are a thief, you don't, you don't want to be satisfied with what you have. How will you walk in the golden streets? Then you can begin to uh, demolish our streets. So that new Jerusalem is for people made new. And we want to have a comparison between the heavenly and the worldly. As we speak now, the worldly are also organizing themselves to have a new world, a new world here so that they can enjoy the maximum. So when we will be enjoying in heaven and then coming down to enjoy in the world made new, they shall have done their things. And so we must be cognizant that as we learn these things, the world is also recruiting people. The way the devil in the book of Revelation chapter 12 convinced a third of angels, the same way he has doubled his effort, now not only to be satisfied by, by that third, but also to recruit humanity to join that bandwagon. So we must be cognizant there are tricks and also the gods, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the godly tricks and God's plans so that we are not living without knowing our surrounding, our surrounding. And so the new world order. We saw last Sabbath uh, in the book of Isaiah chapter 51 verse 6 that uh, Isaiah was calling us to look at the heavens and also to look at the earth beneath the heavens. And he said that the heavens shall vanish away like smoke. And then the, uh, the earth also shall grow old like a garment. Then he gave us the characteristics of an earth that has grown old. And we saw that when the earth grows old, as the place which was made as habitation for human beings, then the death rate will increase. And he says, people living on earth would die like flies. We covered that last week. But today, we want to look at the new world and the way the world is organizing itself to enjoy the last kicks of a dying horse. As we cover this, it will be a bit disturbing. I prepare you in advance so that you'll be able to know that 
when Christ is making us a better place, it will be worse before the better. I repeat, it is going to be darkest before dawn. What do we mean by it being darkest before dawn? As a good Adventist, you must been able to cover, you must have covered um, topics in the great controversy such as the dark, the dark what? Ages, dark ages. And during dark ages, um, it was dark because you were not allowed to proclaim godly things in public. In fact, the disciples were brought to book because they are publishing and they are proclaiming about the name of Jesus. It was dark. And somebody called Paul that we know was brought before a hall like this with two doors. And he was told that today is your day. Choose to denounce or deny the teachings you have taught in these cities and say they are rubbish. It was? It was Luke. Luther Martin. Then you will pass through this door and you'll be safe. Or say you still stand with that message. And then you'll go through this door and you are chopped in the head. Then Paul said, if I live, it is Christ who lives in me. But if I die, death is beneficial. Actually, advantage. Because I shall rest, my work will follow me. Then they were like, now what will we do to this Paul? Because it seems if we kill him, we have advantaged him. And he's confirming that if we leave him to continue being alive, his life is Christ. So he cannot go on speaking any other name apart from the name of Christ. We need courage during dark times. But remember, it will be darkest just before dawn. We want to listen to a bit of introductory video again today. If you are nearer, you'll be benefiting more because you can see and listen, but we'll be loud enough. We'll be loud enough. We have members who will be contributing. Uh, if you have a question anywhere in the process of our discussion, please just note down and we Are you? Are you ready for a new world order? I think, uh, Becky, the, pro the main problem is uh, if you think of the technology, the technology is 21st century, 26th, uh, 2nd century technology. Your Excellency, are you ready for a new world order? I think, uh, Becky, the, pro the main problem is... And you are lucky, I told you last week that you are lucky as a church. you have members of this church who attend these meetings. I don't think you appreciate yourself and why God chose you to be in this congregation. So when this question was posed, we didn't understand what was in it and what the new world order entails. 
And I normally ambush people, so do you also ambush Elder Tudor? Because Elder attended this meeting in Egypt, Cairo, it was very hot. And uh, he will give us, in the midst of this presentation, what was it about preparing the world, the new world order? How is the world preparing itself? Here, this year, there was another meeting like that. Again, it was attended by one of our members. This time, a youth. So you're not a small church. A youth attended COP28 in Dubai. And also, he will talk to us a little bit of what he gathered in that meeting. But the question is, as a church, are you ready for the new world order? So that if you still remain faithful to Jesus, remember there will come a time you will be told you are out of order. And when you are out of order in a parliament, if at all you are adamant, you will be taken out by the sergeant at town. So that order, the world is positioning itself, the church needs to know. One, if you are to be a business person in these last days, you need to know how to position yourself as a business person. And if you are to be a politician, for example, you need to know how to carry out yourself as a politician in the last days. And if you are to be a religious person, you need to know how to propagate the gospel in the last days when orders are new. So this Paul, who has written the, uh, uh, the largest portion of the New Testament, when he landed into a town and he wanted to evangelize that town, he first of all went to study about that town. So he would go to the market and spend time in the marketplace. He would go to the libraries and spend time in their social uh, 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 places. He could study their beliefs, their beliefs. And after that, now when he stood to lift up Jesus, he would, able to, he would be able to, to speak things that are relevant to the listeners. Adventists, we must catch up with the time. Otherwise, we will be irrelevant as evangelists, evangelists of the time. If we know um, the market or we know the people in need of the message, and we know their orientations, then we'll be able to lead them the right way. So the second book after Revelation 20, uh, 21 is Revelation chapter 12. This time we shall read from verses 7 to 12. Chapter 12 from verses 7 to 12. Revelation 12, 7 to 12. The book of the year that we are distributing is entitled The Great Controversy. So this is where it all started, the controversy. Read, my brother. Revelation 12, 7 to 12. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was there place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Verses 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Mm -hmm. 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb 
and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the, unto the dead. Mm -hmm. Twelve, therefore rejoice ye heaven, mm -hmm. and ye that dwell in them. Mm -hmm. War to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I want you to remember two important uh, things there. One, one group is told to rejoice, and that is the group in heaven. Remember, in that group in heaven, there are people who have lived here and have since been graduated to the life in heaven. Like who? Enoch, correct? Another one? Eh? Moses, Elijah, who else? Eh? John, John the Baptist. Uh -huh, uh -huh. 24 elders. Uh -huh. So it is good to be an elder. Just, just remember that from there. Another person who is in heaven and has walked, lived through this earth. Who else? Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. Jesus Christ. So when you see, and, and, and also there are two thirds of angels who never have uh, sinned and remained faithful to God. They're in heaven. So if you go to heaven uh, and you, you enter the, the, the heavenly throne room, you will find sitting arrangement, which is very, very important for us to remember. And in the midst is the throne of God. And at the right hand side of that th same throne is who? Jesus Christ. Now, let's go back to the book of um, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3. We are talking about um, darkness before dawn. And we want to see how the new world order is related to that dark activities before it dawns. Revelation chapter number 3, verses 21 and 22. Read, my brother. The Bible says, Yes. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Mm -hmm. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him mm -hmm. and will sup with him and he with me. Mm -hmm. 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my father in his throne. Now repeat verses 22. Members, now listen carefully. The throne room, God in the center, Christ in the right side, and they are in the same throne, the same level. Before Jesus overcame, it was not a walk in the path. It was dark. He went through dark times. The first dark time was the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. And the second dark experience was the Gethsemane experience. And the third dark experience was at the cross. During these three darkest moments of Jesus' life, the devil would visit him and would whisper to him, forget about dying for people, you know, who are abusing you, people who are... This is what he was told in the, in the, in the cross. If you go through the book, The Desire of Ages, he whispered to him in the cross, you are saying you want to die for your friends. Show me any friend of yours here. And for sure, when Jesus looked down, he could see people and throwing uh, 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 words on him, and some would pierce him. Already the previous night, the best, closest, the leader of the disciples denied him publicly that I don't know that man publicly. Then the devil whispered to him, 
these are the people you are saying you are dying for? The persons you have walked with and you have sent to do miracles are denying you to your face. Forget about this business. Come down the cross, go back to, the, to your, where you came from, enjoy life there as I enjoy this territory. But Jesus never bowed out. He continued. So, so I'm saying, for Jesus to assume the throne, he overcame. For you and me, who also are, is the last church, the last church among the seven in the Revelation 3, we got to overcome. Read my brother, verse 22. 21. 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, uh -huh. even as I also overcame. Uh, yes. And I'm set down with my father in his throne. Can you imagine when we overcome, we will not be in the next cycle in the throne, but we will assume the same place where Jesus overcame and sat, Nikama to Songia to sit with him. Those who overcome. It is good to know what is this we need to overcome as the last church that lives is like in a game and um, two games. One, the, 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 the relay, relay, short, short. The people who are chosen to finish the race, now is the Ladesian church. We have been chosen in the group of seven we are the last group to finish the race. And see, those who finish and overcome, I will grant them to sit with me. Where I also overcame and sat with my father. What is this we need to overcome before that throne room we assume? Remember, even the angels will now be junior to us. In fact, even as we speak, as we speak, the angels who did not uh, defy God's rule and remained faithful are our servants. Read in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. They are serving and helping those who should overcome, those who should um, get saved. Hebrews chapter uh, 1. Uh, just go through chapter 1 from verses 11. What does it say from verses 11? Hebrews chapter 1 verses 11. Yes. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old as doth a garment. Uh, go to verses 14. Verses 14. Mm -hmm. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Now who are these ministering spirits? Verse 13. Verse 13. But which of the angels said he at any time, mm -hmm. sit on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool? Mm -hmm. Verse 14. Mm -hmm. Are they not all ministering spirits mm -hmm. sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Thank you very much. So the angels will follow after the throne has been compacted by the Godhead and also those who shall overcome human beings. And then we have the 20 and four elders. The great controversy is, is, is very important. Just read through. These are the books to spend time with in these times, and you will never be bored. You'll never lack what to share, the throne room of heaven. Let's jump from there and look at how the world is also preparing themselves to enjoy life for the last time. How is the throne room of the world arranged? Let's jump to the book of Second. Uh, Thessalonians chapter 2 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2 and we shall read from verses 2 just read 2nd Thessalonians 2 verses 2 yes that he be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit 
nor by word nor by letter as from us three three let no man deceive you by any means mm -hmm. for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed mm -hmm. the son of perdition mm -hmm. verses four, Verse four who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called god mm -hmm. or that is worshipped so that he as god sitteth in the temple of god shewing himself that he is god now the other person after this presentation you need to have known clearly is the man of sin and now i'm going to read one letter from the man of sin and because we are adventists it is possible we know who the bible refers to as the man of sin so let's try from the left row who is this man who is called the man of sin that paul is referring to in second thessalonians chapter 2 anybody just try any trial in the discussion is allowed because we are learning yes pope thank you very much um in this lecture we'll call that man papacy because um uh, it is an office and not an individual like we talk about presidency but we have one president at a time so papacy is referred to as the man of sin why is he referred to as the man of sin one because there is no any time in the history of the world that we ever had a female pope that's number one for us to identify the office very well this is the only office with three distinct characteristics one it will ever be occupied by a male number two this is the only office whereby church and state are together so we have a president who is also a religious leader in the catholic church where i am from the religious leader of the church is the pope and it's called the pope of rome and the church is not only called the the, the, the catholic church but it's called the roman catholic church so almost all people will all priests must learn the language of when you go Rome, you must do what? Do things the way they do. Talk the way they talk. So even in my local church at home, for a long time, they could present or they could uh, uh, conduct church service in Latin. In Latin. In Latin. Okay? And so when you, when you talk about papacy, it's the man of sin. Now, the whole world is wondering about why the Bible refers to a holy see as a man of sin. And even members of the church may wonder why we are referring to a religious leader as a man of sin. We shall come to learn. And um, a letter has been uh, retrieved from the man of sin and uh, because he's the only office where we have a political leader a president of the of our country with ambassadors all the world over but also is the religious leader of that church where um, uh, uh, every um, church leader must refer to him as an individual now look at 
uh, if you have phones, you can go to uh, Google and refer to a letter uh, dated, uh, dated 4th October 2023. It's entitled Laudate Dium. Laudate Dium. That is a Latin word meaning praise God. A letter written, it's like a proposal written to the world uh, leaders on how the world should shape up in the new world order. So Laudate Dium is a letter that is an improvement of another letter that was written uh, last year and was presented to the World Economic Forum entitled Laudate C. Laudate C. So this time around, it has been improved and uh, talking nicely concerning uh, the new ways of handling ourselves in the world. But let's listen to a few paragraphs in summary of this letter before we come to understand what uh, it entailed. So this was a letter written by the man of sin uh, and the one occupying that office for now is Pope Francis and um, he calls for a speedier action against climate crisis against the climate crisis and he condemns climate change denial there are people who deny the term or the uh, the fact that there's a climate change so the apostolic exhortation dated 4th october 2023 was officially presented uh, uh, presented the following day a thursday morning october 5th uh, let's go down to the content and have a look at where we are interested as a people who need information. The Vatican released the document in Italian. Also, it was released in Belarusian, in German, in English, in Spanish, and in French, in Polish, in Portuguese, and in Arabic. In it, um, uh, Pope Francis VI uh, said uh, the following. Yes. Number one, we need to change our lifestyles. Number two, because our lifestyles will impact our natural environment. When our environment is changed, there would be more tragic damage to the earth. The dramatic environmental degradation strongly affects not only the indigenous peoples, the poor, the endangered species, but also the future of all young people. Very important. He also calls politicians and the rich to work for the common good and not for their own profit and particular interests. Finally, in page 73, or paragraph 73, the Pope emphasizes that when human beings claim to take God's place, they become their own worst enemies. The exhortation focuses on the agency of addressing the climate crisis, offering insights on the current state of the global environment, the inadequacies of current responses, and proposed pathways forward. And uh, before we listen to uh, the next explanatory speaker of this church, 
we are going to see what are the other things in this encyclical. It's like a holy letter written for the world leaders to read and consider to implement. He says we must accept there is environmental, environmental crisis. We must also be able to understand that we have some critic and how do we combat critics of the environmental crisis number 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 three we got to understand the role of technology and how we can be able to uh, embrace technology as we uh, 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 live up to the challenge number four he recommends global cooperation cooperation the document addresses the importance of global cooperation in addressing the climate crisis. It advocates for multilateral agreements and effective global organizations with the authority to ensure the global common good. Critiquing past approaches to decision making um, Laudate Deum calls for a reconfiguration of multilateralism to address inadequacies in the current political mechanisms. Number five, he talked about international and political weakness. He also talked about climate conferences, progress and failures. And the last climate conference we had in Nairobi was very instrumental. And last week we had our president uh, uh, referring to the climate conference that was held in Nairobi. And we have environmentalists in this church who will help us how to live up to our challenge. Then spiritual motivation. Take note on this. The exhortation concludes by calling on people of all religious confessions to react to the climate crisis, specifically addressing the Catholic faithful. Pope Francis reminds them of their responsibility to care for God's creation. The document emphasizes the importance of working in communion and working towards reconciliation with the world. Keep your questions and additions, but let's look at the, the next video, um, technical team, and let's understand in a nutshell the person who is the authority in uh, our uh, prophetic matters, who has learned and was converted from the world and came back and now is able to read and study and I've never seen somebody uh, with the authority in the scripture who has been given pastoral uh, qualification though he never went to a theology school. Let's listen to him and how And there was a new heaven and there was a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea and I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 3. 
Welcome to Q&A with Professor Walter Fight on the Word Inspired. I am your host, Denisha McCurchin, and today we are discussing the new world order. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we come before you with grateful hearts that you have put your breath in our bodies so that we can lift praises to your name. And I ask, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and even now dwell amongst us and fill us with your Holy Spirit, especially anoint your manservant, Professor Walter Fight. Oh Lord, I pray that you would give him wisdom, knowledge, and even finesse to answer these questions so that the listeners will understand and we will leave here revitalized, energized, and enlightened, dear Lord, to do the work you have called us to do. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Okay, so it seems as though we had a little issue with the live stream. Let me see if we are actually live. Okay, yes, we are live. Perfect. All right, so let me take this moment to introduce you all to our very special guest this afternoon. Our guest today is the epitome of a life transformed by Jesus Christ. He initially was a Roman Catholic and then he transitioned to being an atheist and after receiving the truth of God through a tract was able to become a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and today he is known as a renowned speaker and author who specializes in uh, topics concerning lasting events, spirit of prophecy, and even health. And he has developed a organization, a ministry called Clash of Minds, and they take the everlasting gospel to all the world. And tune in to that, or I hope you watch the trailer, Dwelling in the Secret Place, that beautiful book written by his wife, Seneca Fight. So as you heard, he is married to the wonderful and lovely Samika Fight, and I just want to take an opportunity and express my thanks to her for all of the communications that we've had throughout the year and for even availing herself and her husband so that we can all be here today. And he also has children, and I speak of none other but Professor Walter Fight. So if you all can give him a warm virtual welcome, we would greatly appreciate that. And Professor Fight, we are so thankful that you have taken the time to be here with us today. We know it is seven hours, uh, well, so the South African time is seven hours past Eastern Standard Time, which is where I am. So it's about eight o'clock PM where you are. So the Sabbath has long gone, but we are grateful that you are here with us tonight. Well, it's still flowing over your area. So the Sabbath is still going around the world. Indeed, 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 indeed. Yes, yes. Thank you, Professor. So if you have no other words of introduction, we can go straight into our question and answer session. Let's do that. All right. So Professor Fight, our first question is, what is the new world order? And the second part is, what does the Bible say about it? Well, the new world order is nothing other than a attempt or an attempt to join all of the systems of this world into one body controlled from a central place. Uh, that's what they want. According to George W. Bush Sr., it doesn't mean giving up sovereignty, but it does, it does mean relinquishing certain powers to the central body. And uh, what does the Bible say about that? Well, the Bible talks about a beast power, and then it talks about another beast that comes up out of the earth that will force everyone in the whole world to accept the mark of a beast. And if you jump to Revelation chapter 17, 
then it tells you that the kings of the world will give their power unto the beast. So obviously, this new world order is an organization where all the kings of the world, because they have one mind, they are of one view in terms of certain issues. And these, in terms of the Bible, are of course, the religious issues. They are of one mind, and they give their power unto the beast, which means that they make their legislative bodies available to enforcing whatever it is that the beast requires. That's a situation that existed in the Middle Ages, where the church dictated to governments what they should do. That power was taken away during the French Revolution, but the Bible says that it will be restored. There will be a healing of that wound of separation. So the New World Order, as far as I am concerned, is an organized system where all the political entities of the world come together in unison of thought. So there must be some very compelling things which bring about this unison of thought, and then they will give their power unto the system, which is the beast, which the Bible very clearly in Daniel and Revelation defines as the papal system that existed from the Middle Ages onwards. Well, much earlier than that, but wielded its power largely in the Middle Ages. Amen. Amen. Professor Fight, thank you for giving us that synopsis. You know, you spoke about all the kingdoms of this world having one mind and uh, pooling their power to give homage to this beast. And we even see that in the yeah. image of Daniel too, how the iron and clay, they're mixed together and they mingle with one another. They make pledges with one another uh, for the sake of this beast, which you have clearly identified as the papal system. So let's move on to our next question. We understood based on Revelation. So in a nutshell, a new world order is a plan to have systems of the world brought together under one umbrella. And the systems includes political systems. And that is why all presidents and prime ministers must converge every five years. But now, it has been fast-tracked because the days are numbering. So they are doing it every year. So last year, all political leaders and, uh, and uh, religious representatives and economic leaders and uh, people who control educational system and the health systems converge together. They converged last year in a COP. It's called um, uh, COP 27. 27 was last year, now 28 was this year. COP means what? Conference of parties. So everybody who is in an authority in the world. You are a leader of a nation, a leader of a, you know, a religious body. You have to be a member of a COP. And so they come together and give a blueprint on how the world should move together in unison, in unison. So political leaders, uh, political systems must be brought together. Religious systems, must be brought together. Economic system, educational, all this in a new world must come in one. So I would like you, as we are here, any system 
where you participate. Please help us. I'll give a contribution on health systems. You are in the economic world as a business person. I would like, I'd like you also to give us a taste of what new world is dictating from the economics of the world. If you are, uh, uh, you know, you are a religious body, of course you are religious, what does it to do with us? And the professor has said that there is a lot, a lot that we will borrow from this fora to help us understand how to position ourselves as progressive religious organization, as believers in these last days. If we just sleep and assume that things are okay, then we will be caught unawares the way the days of Noah. They were caught unawares when Noah was preaching they said that is a conspiracy theory. We have never seen rain. When now things are getting uh, to the top gear, we may not be able to know. And so that's why we are here. Now, I would like us to listen to um, our, our brother Arthur, Elder, Elder Arthur, from your perspective as a scientist and uh, as um, and also as uh, a delegate for last year, what can you whisper to the church? If you want us to remove cameras, we can, so that we are able to, to be free. And when, 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 when elder has spoken, we'll also give our elder, our first elder chance. Our first elder also was a delegate that time. So they'll choose who will speak first. But then if you want us to to do it local, we can do it, so that we are able to, to capture uh, the gist of what is happening, where not all of us can access. Hallelujah. Karibu, karibu, Elder. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. All right, uh, so, well, the cameras can be on. This is now global news. It's global agenda. Uh, there's nothing to hide about it. The only challenge we face as scientists and Christians is that sometimes you're caught in the middle where your religious beliefs are, are disputed and uh, science tells you this and the Bible says this. And of course, we know that very clearly from the story of creation where you're taught in school that we came from monkeys. And so when an exam is set, uh, question number one, where did humans come from? Choice number one, monkeys. Choice number two, Garden of Eden. Choice number three, I don't know. Which one will you take? Monkeys, because you want to score. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's an exam in school. You've been taught in Pathfinder that we came from, and this is a question we struggle with in school. But the choices are very clear, KCPE. We came from monkeys, choice A. So the correct answer according to the world is A, that we came from evolution. Okay, so that's the kind of conflict that you experience when you, in science, but, but it's not a bad thing. But back to this COP, for COP 27. So COP, as Elder said, is a conference of parties. Parties are countries. Countries sign agreements on different things. So COP27 was an agreement on how to tackle climate. Okay, so we know that the three big problems in the world now, number one is climate change, number two is biodiversity loss, number three is pollution. So the world calls them triple threat crisis. So these, these are the things that are affecting humanity more than anything now. You might be crying that you don't have money in your pocket, but if you go back, the cause of this is either pol pollution, climate change, or biodiversity loss. When God created us, he put us in the Garden of Eden. And for doing that, 
it was very clear that God wanted us to subsist from nature. Our only source of living was supposed to be nature. That's why we started from the Garden of Eden. But what's happening now? We've lost nature. All right, we've lost nature completely. And our problems begin from there, that we are losing nature at a very fast rate. Our water sources are getting polluted now. When you grew up, El Domingo, El Dautiso will tell you that you'd go to a river and drink from the river. Robert, correct or not correct? River watch. We would go and swallow water directly, and there was no diarrhea. You try that now. You'll be dead tomorrow. So the world is completely, that's the level of pollution, because there's all these chemicals from factories and uh, everything going into the, into the ocean. So we are living in a polluted world. We are Christians, yes. We are told that we, God made this earth for us to live in and to enjoy, but we are living in an increasingly dangerous world where all the water sources are polluted. If you don't know, right now, if you dig a well here in church and you take that water to the lab, they will tell you that the level of, what do you call this thing, Elder? Lactobacteria from sewage in our water here is very high. Where does that sewage come from? It comes from us and pollution. So it gives you an example of the kind of world we are living in. It's not the world that God created. Humans are responsible for this problem. Now, that's environmental loss. Today's temperatures, how are you feeling? Hot. 2023 is the hottest year ever recorded on Earth, if you didn't know. 2023. With average temperatures going above the pre-industrial temperatures by more than 0 0.5 degrees centigrade. When I mean that, I mean that pre-industrial means before we had industries and all these pollutions. Temperatures measured those days and now. This year is the hottest. The temperatures having increased by 0 0.5 degrees, which is extreme. Okay? Do you know that this year we had an El Nino? What is the cause of El Nino? Global warming. So Robert just hears El Nino. But the El Nino is caused by the heating of the ocean. There's too much evaporation. There's too much water in the atmosphere. We get excess rain. It's global warming. So the rains that we had just a few weeks ago was the cause of ocean being overheated. Too much water in the atmosphere, too much rain. Causes, disrupts everything. That's part of the problem that these cycles are not normal. They're abnormal and they're caused by human polluting the world with too much carbon dioxide that is causing all this problem. So I'm just giving you the background of why COP27. So the world must meet to agree on how to resolve these problems because they're getting worse and worse. And it's not a problem that can be resolved by a country as Kenya. It is a global issue. Climate change is now a global issue. You've heard of ice melting in the Arctic. Will that affect you, Robert? It won't affect you. That's the problem now. Because melting of ice in the Arctic because of high temperatures is going to cause a sea level rise. So we're going to have more water in the ocean than is expected, and the sea level is going to rise. Sea level rise is a cause of climate change. So if you're buying plot on the beach now, in 2050, that land might be useless because the sea is going to take over. I'm just giving you a heads up. So those are the challenges we are facing now. And these challenges, the world wants to solve them as one big problem of the world. Okay. If you didn't know that we are holding more water as ice that is held in glacier form, if that ice melts in the Arctic, this ocean is going to rise. When it rises, it's going to cause a problem. So COP27 is a conference. It is the 27th meeting of countries. 27 means it's the 27th meeting of countries to sit and discuss the problem of climate change. So I was there. El Domingo was there. <laughs> he was looking at climate from the shipping problem. Climate is going to affect shipping. He will tell you how. I was there as a marine biologist. Climate is affecting the ocean and the wildlife in the ocean. So I was there in that capacity as, you know, ocean expert. So we were discussing how we, can we solve this problem, not as Kenya, not as Tuda, as a world. For us to solve that problem as a world, everybody must come together. Even the Pope comes, religious leaders, as you say,
president, our president makes some of the best statements about climate change. You know that? How we're going to have electric cars in 2024 when we don't even have power. I hope that has not gone on camera. Anyway, but that's the truth. So we, are, we, are, we had a tree planting holiday, didn't we? What was the purpose of that holiday? To fight climate change. So we've made several commitments. So at COP, countries make what they call commitments. We commit to doing this. And those commitments are binding. And when it comes to binding, it means when Kenya agrees to that, it will affect you. You have no choice. When we say we are going to cut on emissions of carbon dioxide, you cannot say we Adventists don't pollute. No, it's going to affect you. And how do we reduce emissions? Our big emissions now currently come from, but the cars. Who can guess the biggest contributor of carbon dioxide in the world? Not country. Which industrial activity contributes the highest amount of carbon dioxide? Of course, there's industries, there's burning of fossil fuel, which is oil and gas. But one of the biggest problems that the, even the Seventh Adventist Church predicted was livestock. Surprised? Keeping cows produces more carbon dioxide than anything. Surprised? Yes. Carbon dioxide. We don't keep the cows that we keep at least a while. But in Europe, do you know there are more cows than people? There are more pigs than people in Netherlands. More pigs than people. And they produce a lot of carbon dioxide. How? The belch of a cow. Bah. It's too much methane. The fat of a cow. Too much methane. The grass they have to eat. You have to clear big land to make their feed. All that carbon that is stored is now emitted into the atmosphere. This tree stores carbon. I'm sorry, the science is a bit complicated. Let me go to the side. But when you cut it and burn it, what happens to the carbon? You release it. And that's why we have to plant trees, because the trees help us to store the carbon. So this tree that you see here is not just a fruit. It has stored carbon. The moment you burn it, Kamakuni, Elder Kamau, unatoyo carbon dioxide in the environment. Kamakuna miti ya kutosha ya kuabsorb yo carbon dioxide, ndi tunakuwa na excess carbon dioxide kwenye atmosphere, ambayo na kinga, jua, kule yu, alafu sasa hii heat, ambayo tukona hapa chini, hayondoki, inakuwa mahapa katikati, tunawanza kusikia joto. Na hiyo ndi naleta shida yote hii ya global warming. Sasa hii COP27, ni kuenda kukutana kujaribu kutatua hii shida. Ki ulimwengu, ulimwengu mzima. Na tulikuwa na COP28, hii halienda COP28, yukopi hii ha? Juzi. Na ni mkutano wa wiki mbili, tunajadaliana, tunakosana, hatukubaliani, tunasema hivi na hivi na hivi. Sasa mbali na COP27, hiyo ni ya climate. Kuna COP zingine. Kuna COP ya biodiversity ambayo ilifanyika last year. Inaito COP, ilikuwa COP15 on conservation biodiversity. Hiyo, ulimwengu ulikubaliana kulinda ama kuweka tengefu asilimia thelathini ya earth to be protected. So the, the world agreed to protect 30% of the world last year. That's another COP. It's called CBD COP 15. Next year in February, there's a COP on environment. It's called UNEA, United Nations Environment Assembly on Environment. It's COP 6. So these COPs ni nyingi, eh? Sasa zinapokuja pamoja kukubaliana, ndiyo inakuja kuleta ile older. Manake, they are coming to deal with problems. But for us to deal with these problems, let us come together. That is the language. Let us come together. And in coming together, a lot of things happen. Compromise, agreeing on things that you may not agree with. But these things, once agreed by your country, they will come now to affect you. You might say it doesn't concern me. All those meetings don't concern me, Elder Kamau. But they concern you because the moment we agree as a country to do something, that thing comes into our laws and we have to affect it. So Robert, when ice melts in the Arctic, it affects you. When somebody throws plastic in the ocean in America, it affects you. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I was on the beach here at Nyali, and you pick any plastic on the beach and read the label of that plastic. 
100 times, 90 percent of the time, that plastic has not come from Mombasa. So I got a plastic bottle, water bottle from Comoros. You know where Comoros is? It traveled all the way to Kenya. That is the problem of pollution we are experiencing. So we are going to have more plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050. If you go to the ocean by 2050, if you don't change anything about our consumption patterns, we're going to be fishing more plastic than fish. That is the level at which the world has gone. This plastic that we're seeing here, how is it connected to your faith? You know, you, you see it here and you think it's not a problem. It is a problem. Why? Because it's causing environmental problems and diseases, but we keep on using them and it's polluting the world. Okay? So as Adventists, yes, as Elder says, we cannot bury our heads in the sand and say, it doesn't concern us. No, it concerns us. But what can we do as a church? We need to be aware of these things. We need to see where the church can play a leading role in resolving these problems in a more acceptable religious way, Christian way. Keeping the environment clean. Reducing destruction of nature. Eating the right foods. Reducing over consumerism is a big problem. We now consume more than we need. And that's part of the problem. So anyway, Elder, that's, that's, that's a cop. So the world, new world order that was being discussed there is how can we solve these global problems together as a world? And once we start talking as a world, then it's a problem. Now, the last one. Last month, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, the president of the U.S. said, it's time for a new world order. How many read that? The pres and then he got a rejoinder from which country? Russia. Russia said, yes, we agree there should be, not a, there should be a new world order, but it, not, it should not be America-centric. America-centric means all the agenda of the new world order should be driven by America. So it's in the news. Watch Al Jazeera. It was a discussion two weeks ago. So as Christians, we should not be worried about these things. We must just be aware that they are there. And the first world order came after World War II, when we created the UN. So the UN was created as a, to, to come up with a new world order at that time, after the war. It's being proposed that we should have a new world order because the world is in a crisis. So new world orders are thought of when the world is in a crisis, like now. And so that's how the world is going. That's how the politics is going. It's affecting the politics. It's affecting religious issues. It's affecting our faith. You can see the discussions now all over. I don't want to talk about them. Very crazy ones of how people should be prayed for. People want to marry of the same sex. Those are the things that are being discussed at a global level. And people are starting to agree you might sit here and say, oh, we as a church, we don't accept. That's true. But they will agree where? Up there. And once it's agreed up there, it affects you. You're told they also have rights. What does the Constitution say? Every Kenyan has got? It starts like that. Wakuna haki pia. Don't judge. They also have rights. They are human beings like you. Also, God loves them. That is how it starts. And then slowly, slowly, we accept and say, but it's true. God loves them. They are all human. They were created by God. So is that sin worse than this sin? That's how we start arguing it out. And then it becomes normal. Thank you. I think that's a, a long discussion for another day. Yeah, yeah. And sorry for taking you in circles, but I thought it was important that we just understand the the essence, when you say COP28, what is it? Mm. We are waiting for COP29. Thank you so much. Let's listen to Elder, uh, Elder, Elder Omingo. Thank you so much, Dr. Tari, for that elaborate, enlightening years. Elder, welcome, and tell us more. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Tari, for making it very simple and clearly understood. So, uh, I also, we, we met together at uh, that conference, COP27. 28, I was away in UK, so I didn't manage. <laughs> but a whole big delegation that went from Kenya here, COP28. So the whole essence, as Dr. Ari has explained, 
is uh, how do we manage this climate change as it's happening now. The big challenge is that uh, since we discovered the, the fuel and we have used it to grow our industries, many of the developed countries had they are the ones who manufacture the vehicles, they are the ones who supply the vehicles, they are the ones who have made very big industries. They have also made a lot of economic uh, developments in their countries. In the, using the fuel, that is now a big problem to us. They have done a lot of agriculture. Like Elder has mentioned, the agriculture contributes almost 40% of the global warming. The, 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 the fossil fuel, the one that produced by the motor vehicles and the, the one that we use the oils for is about 35 percent and then the waste that we throw carelessly around is about 20 percent now we are involved in shipping because shipping is it contributes very little it's only two two percent but it's also significant and so then the focus from the shipping point of view is how best can we be able to reduce that how can we have ships which are not using the fossil fuel to run the engines and that's why they are using other alternatives like uh, hydrogen which is coming up alternative fuels apart from the uh, the bunker the normal one that comes from the for, for, from the fossil from the carbon so then uh, from that perspective the biggest debate is that you used that fuel to pollute the environment and you still continue to pollute it to have your developments taking place and yet as we are not yet developed we also need to build the industries we also need to grow to be like yourselves so how do you tell us to stop at this point in time and uh, while you have used it to grow yourselves so if you tell her to stop then give us alternatives and so the alternative that is coming up is then how do they compensate the fellows who opt to use clean fuel to be able to catch up with the rest and that is the biggest debate and that's why even it brings a lot of controversies because uh, uh, the, the options which are there is like uh, you tax the marketers uh, when you tax the marketers of oil and fuel very heavily the person who will pay the cost of tax is who? you and me <laughs> because you'll meet the cost of that tax from the filling station when you go to put in the fuel now do we get money from the developed countries to be brought back to us Yes, that is possible, but how do we share this money? So there is these things, so these proposals like carbon funding, you are encouraged to plant trees, and when you plant, you can claim some money. I think it's already happening, isn't it? Yeah, if you, if you plant mangroves to that extent, that it can be analyzed and found to be making a contribution in cutting down the carbon from the atmosphere, there's some money coming. There's a lot of research from the shipping point. Uh, recently, like you may have uh, seen, I was away for about three weeks. We were in London, and part of the conversation was, what do we do to, to address the use of the clean fuel in the oil? And from that negotiation conversation, the European Commission, we as Kenya Maritime, we managed to be supported 335 million negotiations. We were given that money. <laughs> I wish it was in my pocket, no. <laughs> it was given because we already have a center that picks samples from ships which are coming to the ports to find out the quality of the fuel that they are using and use that data to see how best can we be able to improve the fuel that is consumed by the ships as they come in. So we have a center at uh, Ambalal. It is run by KMA, JQuat, <coughs> KPA. We team together to win that center so that we can be able to continue the research on the best use of the, of the, of the fossil fuel. So that debate is there. The new order is coming. It is a reality. <laughs> I disappeared after lunch. You know where I went? I just went back to the house and they took a very cold shower. <laughs> Even the shower was not cold. It was hot. Hey. <laughs> but at least it has, um, I'm able to, it was hot. I don't know how you people felt it this. And that's not enough. It is becoming worse as time goes by. So if there is a scientific way of dealing with this problem, let us be aware and let us do in our own small ways. Like Dr. has mentioned, let us be careful. Whatever little that you contribute in terms of the environment, the waste, that waste, if you don't take care of it properly, it has a contribution to make in the climate change debate. So it's upon you to be conscious of these things, use the science, use the facts. Uh, okay, I cannot rule out the prophetic uh, uh, <laughs> the prophetic narrations 
that is coming up similar to 666 and uh, you, you cannot sell without buy. I have, I have no idea about those ones. <laughs> if you tell me to explain, I'll be completely lost. <laughs> but <laughs> they are there. But let's, let's be a little bit more informed scientifically than picking one or two items from this desire to address this problem and touching it to the Bible and trying to create a, a very, very fulfillment of a new prophecy in terms of what was predicted earlier. I think basically this is a scientific problem which has been proven. It is happening. Uh, Elena was very happy. Really? No, no. Let me not say I was happy. <laughs> but in my village, you know, for the first time we were harvesting maize in December. Nilienda nyumbani nikakuta mahindi iko. Never. It has never happened. December is normally very dry. But at least we got some rain. It's only bad for those people who live in the low, the low waters. But for us in the mountains, if you did some farming in the, farming in the mountains, it was pretty very, very good. But that is not how it tends to be. Because it has got a pattern that we all know right from the beginning. Now, this pattern is changing in terms of how we plan our things, how we support the farming, how we prepare. It is changing because of our, ourselves. We, the human beings, we are the main culprit. So if you are not conscious, in, in UK, they are stopping the use of uh, petrol and diesels. I think 20, 20, 30 or something like that. 20, very, very nearly they are stopping it. But again, it also has another problem, that the batteries just explode, and when they explode, they become very, very dangerous. So it is a problem that has to be sorted out. We have to find how to contribute. But if you can plant your trees, like the current, uh, the current emphasis on tree planting, let's take it very seriously. When the rains come, let's plant trees. Let's do the mangroves. Mangrove is very efficient in terms of absorbing carbon. And also, let us eat less. And be extremely careful with, uh, with the bottle, the waste, and all these things. And if we are conscious, we know them, take interest, we read them, it's also good for us to understand and get to know all these things. I think that that's what I want to comment on that. Yes. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you so much. What do you say to them? Those are our delegates who are able to attend and listen from the horse's mouth. I would like us to listen to Ben Iha as we conclude. Iha now was uh, able to attend uh, these years in Dubai. Uh, where is Ben? Ben, yeah, yeah. Welcome, welcome, Ben. Uh, <laughs> the Kiswahili word for mangrove. Thank you so much. This is our our youth, we are proud of you. Tell us what you picked and uh, what we should know. All right, uh, thank you. When I grow up, I want to be like Elda, Atha, and Lomingo. Yeah, so um, I was privileged as well to attend the COP28 this year. And basically, again, um, uh, I was more interested with the blue economy because that's uh, my industry. And um, Elda has spoken, uh, the two elders have spoken a lot about what happens there. Uh, so I think probably what I'm going to talk about is the opportunities that probably arise from all these problems. Uh, and basically, um, I think um, the climate issue is going to keep on. It's not something that's going to like go uh, be over in a number of years or something. So it's something that's going to change, and it's going to change rapidly. Actually, right now, I say we are in the phase of change before everything changes to become um, was probably. So within all these things, we have adaptations that uh, offer opportunities for different people, especially the youth who can come up with innovations that are going to assist us to adapt or probably mitigate whatever is already happening. Uh, just to give um, uh, an example uh, of how someone can come up with a solution, basically, is that um, there's this little town back um, in the US known as Maine. Main, uh, it was a fishing local community, and basically these guys were, they are still renowned as uh, people are offering the best lobster uh, worldwide. And if you go to supermarkets, you're going to see lobster main being sold. So um, these guys, uh, they're thriving economically on uh, producing main lobster. And um, after a while, due to high industrial aid fishing, again, which is uh, a cause for the climate change, a, a climate crisis, especially on the loss of biodiversity, um, these lobsters uh, 
uh, went low. So the catches became lower and lower. And this ideally was because of over, uh, over, over fishing, basically, and also uh, the changes in the uh, sea chemical, uh, sea uh, components, ideally. So scientists uh, in that community came together and they said, um, our community relies heavily on this uh, economic uh, activity of lobster fishing, but we, do not, we are not able to get more from the ocean. And it's something that's also happening currently within our Kenyan waters, whereby our catches, when you compare in the 90s and now, everything is going lower by lower. If you just compare even uh, last year and this year's, our catches are going lower. So basically, um, how can we ensure that we're capable to maximum within our community? So these guys brought one and one. They brought science into it. And basically, um, the, the solution that came out was that um, let's ensure that uh, small harvesters are able to go out and fish the same lobster. But now, because they are small, they are not going to get as many uh, lobsters from the ocean as what industrial uh, vessels will do. Uh, but remember, if we give, if these small harvesters go out and they catch less, let's say they catch 10 kgs per fisherman or per boat, that's going to mean that they're going to get less income. So how do you ensure that they can still go out, fish the little amount of fish that they can, but still be able to make the same kind of income? So we brought, they brought in the idea of quality, whereby. Um, you produce superior quality and uh, the idea of having sustainable uh, or climate kind of business that enable them to now uh, grow this industry back to where it, uh, it had been a long time ago. So um, ideally, what I'm trying to emphasize is that um, as a youth, uh, as a youth, uh, as an adult, or wherever you are in your own industry right now, there's an opportunity for you to one, tap into the global finance by basically orienting your business or orienting your solutions to be climate uh, mitigators ideally. And it's not a hard task. This happens in the agriculture sector. It happens um, in waste management. It happens in the black economy industry, which I am in. So ideally, um, probably as one of your thoughts for the new year 2024, for whatever you are doing, and also actually it has to do with something with alternative livelihoods and gender balance and gender equalities and all that. Uh, you can factor in these aspects of climate mitigation that's also going to be an opportunity for you to raise income and be financially capable. Thank you. Thank you so much, thank you so much. Before, uh, please don't go away so far because you may be having questions from the congregation. But Elder uh, is another a uh, scientist who is able to give us uh, a feel of what is happening and what should we do. Karim. Kamjambo. Uh, I'm trying to listen or to think aloud on what is happening in the world today and what does the Bible say because the world is speaking when we started from the book of Revelation 21 it says the new world order and I saw the new heaven and the new earth there are so many things which are coming up in the world today what we call the human effort to check on what is excess in the world today. But it reminds me also on God says, if you read the book of Ellen G. White says, we need to go back to Eden. We need to go and set the pace as Adventists. How are we supposed to live? Our life, our environment, how does it reflect? Because if you look the way when God created man and how he had set the garden of heaven and how we are living today, there's a lot of ignorance because 
uh, people don't want to see trees. People don't even want to see space in the water catchment places. Now they are out of trees. So we don't even have uh, the water towers. So as much as the world is trying to explain, we cannot be able to control the human population. And a part of what the human population, the world is talking, that is why we, they are coming up with gay marriages as, a, as part of reducing the human population. And you will be hearing about taxes for those who are going to marry and those who are married, and all these things will come. To reduce human population is also another agenda so that they can try to see how best the world can be managed. But you see, the Bible has revealed everything. We are right at the edge. When we are right at the end of age, end of a generation, and the Bible has not hidden anything from us, those ones who listen and read their, 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 the newspapers, the Pope himself says, you can now place the gays. And the Bible says, in the last days, as it was in the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be in the time of the end. So as much as we fight to mitigate climate change, we also need to be aware of the best lenses which will come. We need to be prepared as people of the book. We should not keep away from understanding and searching the scriptures and the prophetic messages to guide us to know the times that we live and how best we can be, be prepared for the second coming of Jesus Christ. There are many theories when we talk about, like now we were talking about cap on credit. For those ones who have planted a lot of trees, there's cap on credit. You need to get some, we are supposed to be paid some rates. If you, how do you get this? Elders spoke about the industrial revolution, other these developed countries, how they have done a lot of industries, they have developed, they have done everything. And when you come to Africa, actually Africa, we have not done worse as this other developed world. So as much as the world is trying to teach us, remember the Africans are waking up to the realities of the economic reparation. Now the climate change is coming in, again, to suppress anything that we want to do. But the fact remains, we need to be aware the times are a bit dark. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elder, for that addition and the wake-up call. We are now giving a chance to the members who want to ask questions and give additions uh, so start with Brother Robert. Uh, so if you want to do a contribution, please raise your hand so that we plan for you a minute. Oh, Sister Mina here. Uh, yeah, we have those two. Um, happy Sabbath. Happy day. Uh, I like the, the way we've uh, gone through the discussion. But I think there's something we are losing because... Uh, what we are talking about is uh, the time we are. If you go through everything, I think you need to understand first that uh, there's a question I ask in our class. I think the class was somewhere here. That do we know who are God's enemy? And we learned that God's enemies are three. One of them is devil. Another one is the world. And the third one is flesh. So if we want to try and do things here that uh, will make us adopt to God's enemies, then I think we are losing it. 
as uh, people of the book. Why do I say so? Is uh, there's nothing that human beings can do to rectify what God created. Because God is the creator. And anything you're trying to come up with to uh, maybe do what God did, then I think you're not prepared to what God said. I think we are told to prepare for the problems that are supposed to come and they should not get us uh, by surprise because we've read and understood the, the word of God. And all these are happening because of what we chose as human beings that we decided to disobey the will of God. But God says that uh, up here, uh, blessed are those who suffer today because the kingdom of God belongs to them. Why do I bring all this? If we today start saying that uh, we need now to do things to put us in a, a way that will protect us away from the main person, the main person that can protect man is God. What we need to do as believers is to trust fully uh, in God to enable him to take us through uh, the valleys of death because he's saying that even if we are passing through the valleys of death is with us when Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were thrown in the furnace of fires they were supposed to sublime sublime is a condition where you move from a solid state to gaseous without doing what? passing through the liquid uh, state but what happened? God was there in time to help them. What are we supposed to do? We need not to lose faith or be scared with the things that the devil is trying to peddle around that if you do this, because we are told, do not fear. So if we fear put across us, then we are not people of the book. Then we are losing it. We really need to stand firm and know that there is nothing that is impossible with our God who created this world, who also created us, and who can do things that we as human beings think are impossible. Thank you. Thank you so much. What do you say to our brother Robert? Thank you. Do not fear. It will be darkest before dawn, but fear not. Welcome, Sister Mina. Thank you. I just want to, to thank our, our two elders and even you who has really opened our, our eyes on what is happening in the world today. And uh, this is just but a fulfillment of, a prof of prophecy, Bible prophecy. It is nothing new to the book. It is a fulfillment of prophet and um, a prophecy. Like when you look at uh, Daniel chapter 7, uh, there is a, there is a, a prediction, a Bible prophecy there about kingdoms. And uh, I'm interested in uh, uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, where it's talking about this man of petition. petition. This man it says he shall speak words against the most high that's how to identify him you know when we are talking to us as seventh day adventists inside here in the church for those of us who have read about it it might be easier for us to understand but for somebody who is coming from nowhere it's not so easy yeah why are you likening all this world order to this man of petition but when you come uh, with the Bible truths, the foundational about prophecy, about this man and identify him with the Bible, that first of all, the Bible talks of this, this particular kingdom and this particular system, that he shall speak words against the Most High. Who has ever done that? Then you'll be able to, to identify him. 
that shall wear out the holy ones of the Most High and shall attempt to change the sacred seasons and the law. That is very important. And they shall be given into his power for a time, two times and half a time. That is Daniel. There is so much to learn about that. Then we talk about also about uh, the end times and we are living in the end times we know. And Jesus himself prophesied about the signs of the end. When you look at Matthew chapter 24, all that is streamlined down, the signs. This is just climate, climate change is just one of the signs. But we have so many of them. They started long ago, 1844, yeah? And we are at the age of the, the time. So by dwelling on just one, may create some fear instead of making us prepare for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Where I grew up, people in church, some of them who knew about Bible prophecy, would now stand up and now start pointing fingers. Did you hear Pope was in Rome and this is what he said. Now you see, so people started looking for where Pope is going and what Pope is going to do. But as Christians who are waiting for Jesus Christ, what ought we to do? Are we supposed to watch what Pope is doing or we are supposed to, to get prepared as Christians for the time is near? Jesus again in, uh, in Luke, Luke chapter, that one I'll read, Luke, Luke chapter 21, after, after saying all the, the signs of the end, he says that when that happens, that is Luke chapter 21 verse, verse uh, 28, he says, now when these things begin to take place, you who are Christians, what should you do? Stand up and raise your heads up because your redemption is drawing near. That should be an encouragement to us that we should stand up and know, hopefully, that we are actually uh, going to be redeemed. So it should not create fear in us. We should actually be preparing for home, that our master is soon coming. That's my contribution. Amen, amen. What do we say to her? Amen. That is very important and very relevant. Give to our brother Calvin. What should I do, having seen all those things take place? I should look up because our salvation is nearing. Welcome, Mr. Uh, mine is a question. Um, we've talked about uh, new world order. That this event that the prophecy talks about that they will take place. So my question is, the order and the stage where we are in. We have uh, shaking of the church, and then we have uh, end of probation, and then we have Sunday law, and then we have new world order. We've mentioned about new world order. And uh, I think there's a place I read saying that uh, when you see new uh, Sunday law enacted, it means that the end of probation has taken place. So where we are right now, as we talk about new world order, uh, these other activities, will they come after, or at what stage are we under the order of those, those events? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, am I locking anybody out? Let's listen to Elder. So just to clarify that to the New World Order is both a political and a religious it has two perspectives. So what we are discussing here today is actually the political new world order. The Bible talks about what you just said, the new world order that will come, uh, I mean, uh, the way we understand it. But in the minds of the political leadership of the world, the world is in such a mess that it requires to be reorganized. So the, the, the whole idea of the new world order is trying to reorganize the world. So as I give an example, the first world order was after the world war, when everything was in chaos, nations were burnt down, there was nothing, economy was crumbling. And then the United Nations was formed 
to help set a new world order. The nations were supposed to unite under the United Nations. That's how the UN came. Okay. And the UN has got so many arms okay, uh, that, 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 that does global, global things. If you talk about FAO, for example, Food and Agriculture is a UN body. If you talk about UNHCR for refugees, it's a UN arm. So UN has got many functions. But now, things are getting out of control. And climate, I think, was just one example that we, because we were talking about COP27. As I said, COP27 is just for climate. There are many COPs. There's COP for agriculture, there's COP for everything. And they all fall under the UN. So as you correctly say, there are many things. But right now, the world is, is so tumultuous, it's so chaotic, that some leaders feel that there needs to be reorganization. So the new world, so in terms of, from the perspective of climate, things need to be done differently. From the perspective of politics, things need to be done differently. And we cannot run away from this because it's affecting us. So right now, everybody's shouting about fuel prices. Who has not been hit by fuel prices? Why do we complain if it's not our business as Christians? Where does it come from? There's war in Ukraine. There's war in Palestine. Is it your business that there's war in Israel and Palestine? Because it's affecting your life here. So all those things you're talking about are causing disruptions in the economy. They're causing disruptions everywhere. They're affecting businesses. And so there's this feeling that probably if we have a central system that is managing peace, that is managing environment, that is managing all these things, probably we might have some order. So it's kind of some very lofty thinking of trying to put the world under one kind of organization. So that's a political perspective of the new world order. And I want to emphasize that we as Adventists, yes, we believe in the Bible and it's all written. But these things affect us directly. And there's no way we are going to keep our heads in the sand and say, we just wait. No. You cannot just sit and wait. If we just waited, this house would not have been built. God has given us minds to think. He has given us reason to reason. He has given us knowledge to argue and to come up with solutions even for the world. You know, we Adventists have solutions for the world. But the thing is that we don't want to see ourselves as the solution. Instead, we want to block ourselves from the problem and say, that's not us. It's not affecting us. Let's get prepared. There's no time to get prepared. You live your prophecy now. There's no day you're sitting and waiting for the, for the, for the what do you call it? The Sunday Lord to come, that it will come. No. This, what we are seeing now is what the Bible calls the shaping of events. Events are shaping up. By the time the Sunday Lord comes, it will be too late for you because you are sitting there waiting for it. You're not understanding how things are evolving. All right? Corona came, it was a big controversy. Vaccinate or not to vaccinate. Okay? So you understand the politics. I, want to do, I don't want to go into there. But that is how things are shaping up. So let us not be, as Nina says, it's not supposed to scare us. But on the other hand, we are not supposed to play ignorant. Because people will perish for lack of knowledge. And that knowledge is not just biblical knowledge. It's all knowledge. You have to understand what's happening. Because these things affect us. But we have solutions as Adventists. One of the things I've been saying is that, you know, Adventists, our way of living is already a problem solver to many things, to diseases. Why is the world talking about diseases when we have the answer that we should eat properly? Why can't we tell the world and be an example that because we are eating properly, we are we are this way. So we have solutions for the world. So there's a problem, but we are part of the problem because we have allowed the world to shape the way we think and not the other way around. Who said that we cannot have Adventist villages where the whole world can come and say, let us go to that Adventist village. I hear they don't get sick there. They don't even go to hospital there. They are always healthy. They live 100 years like Loma Linda. Those are the solutions. Mm -hmm. But why? We don't want to live our Adventist faith. We talk about it, we don't live it. 
we can be the solution to all these problems because we love clean environment, we love clean health. Our message has got all these things built in. But the problem is we know how to read and talk about it. That one, 100%. Doing. So for me as an Adventist, I practice and, that, and I say, okay, as a scientist, there are things that I can use my knowledge and my belief to advance the right solutions. What is the problem making sure that all our compound here is forested so that we don't suffer from heat strokes? But engineers like Robert, when they see a tree, it must go down. When I see a tree, I want it to stay. Why? Because you see that tree that was here? When it went, you know what happened? Can somebody tell me what happened in this church? You people don't observe things because you don't understand how nature works. When this tree was here, during lunch we were all sitting here. True or false? Now we have all migrated to the tent. So which one was better, the tree or the tent? The tree would occupy this whole space. We were all under the tree. But now we're squeezing ourselves under some hot tank and only one tree is remaining there. Why can't we sit right in the middle of the road there during lunch? Why are we looking for shade? Because God has given us a solution that we don't want to use. So as part of this lesson, can we think of how we're going to plant trees here as an example of fighting climate? So that when we have lunch, we are under trees, not under tents. May God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I would like us to, to, to go to the question which Calvin asked. That, so, so, so where are we in the stream of time? And when you talk about um, the events as they unfold, at which point are we from the Sunday law and the things that make us have a head up. And somebody mentioned that we don't just sit down waiting for pronunciation that now all of us must worship on Sunday. It starts now by you inculcating, we were in the Know Your Bible class, and we were talking about our fundamental beliefs. And we talked about how can you make them your habits so that you have a habit you have inculcated. Not just our, the things we speak, like Ella is saying, in our mouth, but we don't practice. So where are we? According to the book of, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll give our brother Chogo a chance, before that, let's listen to the book of Second Thessalonians chapter two. We read up to verse, uh, three. Now let's read from verses four. Uh, from verses three. Now let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. That is a very important a statement made by Paul that that day of the second coming of Christ will not come until there comes a falling away fast. What is this falling away? Maybe a lesson for another day, but for now in a nutshell, just remember that people will turn their back from true Christianity before Christ comes the second time and they will take you know they will take their positions as Elder was saying the world is reorganizing itself what about the church is it possible as a member of the church you can position yourself to be sealed as God's person so that whatever takes place from the political arena, from the religious arena, you are safe under the control of Christ. So where are we in the stream of time? According to the book of Matthew, this man of sin has also been referred to by Daniel 
and quoted by Jesus in the book of Matthew 24 and from verses 15. Let's read Matthew 24, verses 15. There are many signs of Jesus' second coming that should wake us up. But one of the signs that Jesus talked about, which was very determinant, is in verse 15. It says, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place whoso readeth let him understand then let them which be in Judea flee into mountains and let him which is in the how it has been given a good flood more than ever before I have information about one Pentecostal pastor. Actually, there were three of them. They went for Acacia, around Rabai, uh, around Malindi, for Acacia. And then when they finished, they were driving back home at 4 a.m. in the morning. Three pastors and one daughter in the vehicle. And they look at a stream and they said the stream was, was full, now it has gone down. They were to cross that stream because the river uh, uh, overflew. So they were crossing. The road was passing through the river. Then they went because now the river had, the tides had gone down. When they entered with a pro box, when they reached the middle of the river, it increased and there was no red figure. He has been referred to us from the books of prophecy and the Bible as someone with an ill motive as an individual a very good person as an used by the devil and so we must not take pronunciations from the man of sin the next week we'll be able to present here and he has come up with a proposal and he does a lot of research. That's why I, I like this leader because he doesn't just speak. He speaks research-based findings. So they went to Israel and they did a study about climate, I mean about the environmental um, degradation. And guess what? Pope has given Israel as the example, as the best example in the world where the climate has not been degraded, where the atmosphere has not been damaged as other nations have. And the finding that he came up with is that because Israel poses every week, once in 24 hours, total pause from industrial activities. So there is no vehicle, I'm told, I've never been there, maybe Elder has gone, no vehicle moving in Israel on Sabbath. No portion meal. Even if you just want a small portion, um, you can't get a portion mill grinding on Sabbath. No industry is working on Sabbath in Israel. And now, in Laudato Dium, he's proposing that the world need to come to this realization that if Israel is that good in the atmosphere, because they post just once in a week, how about finding how the world can also post simultaneously once in a week. So the banks, the economic, we talked about systems of the world. So economic system, can you talk to the bankers to close once in a week so that they are home with their families? Talk also to the uh, 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 people managing industries to close once, one day in a week, and they pause, and they have found that if the world would do that, then the whole world would pause just once in a week, 
we would improve whatever we are emitting in the stratosphere, in the, in the atmosphere that damages our ozone layer and messes the heat that comes to us and messes the, the rainfalls that comes to us without control. And so we are going to see in the next level that he has said and he has proposed to the world leaders, let us see a day when all of us can pose together. And that day, according to the research, that day is Sunday. Because they, they, they are using evidence. They're not just coming and they're saying the Bible has said, uh uh. They said, according to the people in this COP, how many are we here? We want to vote for our day. That day which we can go and tell our countries to rest, all of us. And as somebody said, those resolutions of the COP will be binding. All the laws of the countries that are in the COP will be subordinate to the global law. And so it may catch up with us in that way. That's why Ella said, don't wait until it's pronounced. Then you look at your position with God. It is now you make your position. It may not be very important to know where are we standing? Uh, how many years are remaining before that Sunday law is pronounced? Mm -mm. It may not help. What will help is to know. The Bible says, John, I mean John, uh, I think chapter, chapter 4, when Jesus is discussing with the Samaritan lady, a time is coming, it is now, when those who worship God will true worshiper will worship God in spirit and truth. If Sunday is not truth, are you prepared not to worship on Sunday? Or because it has been announced in the social media and in the televisions and in the law of the land and in the, uh, the cop, you will abide? What about when the whole world has accepted to give their powers, and we shall read uh, as we close. When the whole world has accepted to give their powers to the man of sin, and the man of sin said, as a stamp of my authority, we must worship on Sunday. It will be dark. Before it is dark, get acquainted with that, says the Lord and reconnect with Christ. He'll give you power to say no. The way the three Hebrew boys said no to the rule of the law of the land, to the king, and said, the king, we are not careful to answer you concerning that matter. Are you prepared? That is why we are giving these presentations so that you know we are nearing those pronunciations than when we started to believe. So should the Pope now convince the whole world, and we shall read it is soon, are you ready? If the new world order will say there is an order in which we shall worship in this new world order, are you prepared to say no when the whole world has said yes? Let's have this. Um, let's have just one illustration, and then we read the book of um, uh, Revelation, chapter 17. And um, as we look at that last.
it seemed as if the issue of the man of sin ended. But according to the Bible, the rulership that was ruling the world and religious world at that time that killed believers in Christ will come back again. And now, according to the telltales, we are seeing the papacy becoming influential again and addressing even the, the house of the house of what? British Parliament. And is addressing a cop. It means he wants to sell his ideas to the nations. And very scientific ideas. As we make use of the good parts of it. Because the devil will come with 99% good. And only 1% bad. Can you single out the 1% out of 99, that is the concern of Jesus. And so, um, the Bible says, this have uh, uh, verse 12, and the 10 horns which you sowest are 10 kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So the Sunday law has not been pronounced. When it is pronounced, the ten kings which are in the covering the whole world, the world according to the new world order, the world has been divided into ten regions with the representatives of each and every region. Those people or representatives have not yet received kingdom yet, but they will receive when the Sunday law is passed and they will rule with the beast. Listen to the next verse. Uh, These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. The ten kings who, who will be elected and not uh, who will be selected and not elected. They are going to lead the 10 regions in the world. Africa has been blessed to have three out of the 10. And let you be informed that one of them in Africa is South Africa. Another one is Kenya. And another one is Nigeria. Those three regions in Africa will form part of the new government of the world. And so Kenya is very important because it influences a lot of East African economy. And so Kenya and its leadership are very important. Now, they have one mind, those 10 kings, a mind of a nation is in its constitution. So when we talk about one mind, it means things that unite us. Things that we can refer to as our point of reference. Uh, one mind. So the constitutions of the land will be able to be changed, to be able to dance the tune of the new world the tune of the new world so that, and that's why Elder was saying, in that constitution of the new world some things may not be palatable to staunch Christians though they will be agreed upon in the world forum but they will affect us here what we are about to go through is like the field of Dura where people discussed in the palace and they discussed with the king and the advisors of the king told the king there are some people in your kingdom who are your very good workers but they don't worship the way you want us to do and we will prove to you that they are so 
call a meeting and you will see. A meeting will be called, I don't know where. And then a group of people will say them according to their fundamentals. They can only, and, and according to the Bible, they can only worship on Sabbath. Then you shall be branded because you don't go by the uh, United Nations and the world organizations you will be branded as fundamentalists because you, you rely on your fundamental beliefs and you're going to be a diehard. The same rules which were passed by the United Nations to take care of uh, uh, the fundamentalists, jihadists, those who can kill and can even die in the process will also apply to these fundamentalists who must keep the Sabbath holy no matter what has been agreed at the global forum. Um, what do you have there? Um, technical team, as we prepare to listen to our brother Chogo before we pray.
listen to this conclusion of the matter. The end game of these appearances, things that appear very innocent and very productive and uh, problem solving, the end game is that as Israel is able to worship and not do work and they are safe environmentally, the world is going to be called upon to rest in one day together. And that is where ecumenism comes in. That the, a system of worship has also brought their allegiance. And they have said the way politic, politicians have brought their allegiance, also they are coming and saying the protest is over. Let us under, be, be under, under one umbrella. And the people will begin to implement what the Pope of Rome has commanded and you where will you stand at that time yes welcome elder. thank you elder um, from the biblical point of view they will say peace and there shall be no peace what the world is doing now they are preparing people psychologically they are doing the Thank you.